Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, my name is Andres, and I'm a researcher here in Microsoft Research. And I have the pleasure to introduce Neil Kahn. Uh, he's uh, actually a cognitive science scientist by training. Uh, he went to grad school in um, uh, Tufts. Uh, he uh, focused on psychology. And he's also kind of on the side, he has been doing a lot of work in comics. So I think part of what he's uh, presenting today is kind of like the amalgamation of his research uh, on linguistics and psychology, cognitive science, and his kind of passion for comics. And so he's going to be presenting uh, his book, The Visual Language of Comics, which is uh, you can buy. It's over there. It's for $40. He'll sign it and draw a comic for you as well. Um, so without any more introduction, let me um, introduce Neil. Thanks. So, um, so thank you for having me. This is very fun and exciting to be able to be here. This is uh, fun to be able to present to people in couches, certainly. Um, uh, so uh, just a little bit of background before I start is that I uh, started working in the comic industry when I was about 14. Um, these are some of the comics that I've drawn. Um, and when I was in college, I basically started taking some classes on uh, linguistics and cognitive science. And I started noticing that things that were happening in comics were similar to things that were happening in language. And I realized that nobody had really done this very much before. And kind of down, the further I got in the rabbit hole uh, of Thinking about these issues, the more uh, I realized there was a lot more there than uh, I might have suspected. So um, I kind of used my knowledge as a creator to then inform the research and uh, somewhat the reverse as well. But uh, I mostly just do the research these days. Um, so uh, that brings us back to here, uh, which is uh, thinking about these things in, in terms of uh, cognition and uh, science, essentially. So um, if we're going to talk about the relationship between, say, drawing and language, or between uh, comics and language, like what is it that I mean by a visual language, we really need to talk about what is language first. So uh, let me start by just asking some questions. Um, this is the audience participation portion, I guess, um, which is, can you speak? So OK, yes. So I, and I hear your response, which means that, yes, there is a nice uh, you are speaking back to me. So the follow-up question would be then, um, these aren't very hard questions. So um, what do you speak in is the next question. So what do you speak in? Words, sounds. So usually somebody would probably say, well, language and then English maybe of the type of language that is. Okay. So now let me ask you, um, can you draw? So I hear a lot more timid responses. Um, and, but basically everybody can draw. They don't necessarily feel that they can draw proficiently, right? Like everybody can at least make marks that have some sort of representational value, maybe. Okay, so then the follow-up question is, in line with my previous questions, what do you draw in? Right, so pencil, a notebook, those are very different answers than, say, English, right? But really, my argument is that they are parallel questions. Uh, to what do you speak in. So the answer to what do you draw in is you draw in a visual language. Um, and you might draw in not just a visual language generally, but a specific type of visual language. So American visual language or Japanese visual language or something like that. And we're going to go into more detail what that might mean. So that's to set the stage of that's the, the, an, the parallelism that I'm, I'm trying to get at. Uh, so Human beings, as a species, have three modalities that we can convey our concepts with. Okay? We can uh, create sounds, which if we had sound, you'd be able to hear uh, that this is someone saying words, like I am doing right now. So I'll kind of embody my slide. Uh, we can move our bodies, especially our hands and our faces, uh, to convey meaning. And uh, we can uh, draw things, basically. Um, uh, and these are, so that's to make marks on a, a page that are meaningful representationally. Um, these are the only three options we as a, as a species have for conveying meaning. Uh, we don't emit smells to each other to communicate. We don't secrete things and lick each other to communicate. 
as exciting as that sounds, it would make for a very different sort of lecture. Um, uh, but the, you know, this is basically what we as uh, human beings do. And, and um, I'll make a note that writing is essentially the conversion of the auditory form into the visual graphic form. So it's essentially a, a synesthesia. It's a learned synesthesia that we do as a culture. That's very useful, but naturally these operate on their own. Okay, so my theory says that whenever you have any of these kind of conceptually expressive, me these meaningful modalities, right, and you put them into a coherent sequence, such that that sequence is governed by a system of rules that some sequences are good and make sense and others do not make sense, i.e. a grammar, what we would call a grammar, um, it becomes a type of language. So structured sequential sounds become spoken languages of the world, right? English, Japanese, Swahili. Structured sequential body motions become sign languages of the world, which are also not universal. So there's American sign language, British sign language, actually not mutually intelligible, um, and Japanese sign language, and there's lots of sign languages of the world. So my argument then is that when you have structured sequential images, they literally become visual languages of the world, right? So you have this combination of meaning, the modality, and the grammar, okay? And that's what gives you a type of language. So these things that we see, which we call comics, are actually written in two different languages. They're written in a verbal or written language that's the converted version into the, the visual form and the visual language. These things are the biological cognitive abilities that we use to create comics. Um, so just for clarification, I want to say that comics are not a language. So that is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that comics are a language. In fact, I'm going to say it's so important that I'm going to say it again. Comics are not a language, okay? The argument, rather, is that comics are to, let's say, American visual language, which is the brand that we uh, usually read with superheroes and or cartoony things. There might be different dialects of that. Let's say American visual language. What novels are to English, okay? Which is to say that Comics and novels are the kind of sociocultural context, and visual language in English are the languages that are used to write these, right? So we use, again, American visual language to write comics. We use English to write novels. It's just the case that um, you actually use two different languages in the case of comics. You use English and an American visual language, right? So. That's the distinction that I'm making. It's not that comics are a language, it's that they're written in a language. Okay, so what's a language then? So we have at least some basis of this. It's a, a modality uh, that has meaning, that is, has a grammar. Well, ultimately that means that these are patterns that are stored in people's heads, right? It's not that they're, a language isn't floating out into the cultural ether the way we talk about it, right? Um, it's purely instantiated in patterns in people's heads. So, I speak English because these are the patterns that are in my head, and to the degree that the patterns in my head or your heads um, are, you know, shared by other people, um, we say that we speak similar languages. And that's not necessarily a clean-cut division. There might be certain groups that, you know, have rough overlaps with others, right? Um, such that some people, you know, are mutually intelligible with multiple groups, but those outer groups are not mutually intelligible, right? So when we carve up these languages, those are kind of so geopolitical distinctions, but really we're talking about patterns that are in people's heads. Okay, so that's the basis of it. So in my book, um, the uh, overall argument that I make is this, that we have these patterns in people's heads that relate to graphic information. Uh, these visual languages use a visual vocabulary, just like uh, spoken languages. They're, they are built of memorized pieces of uh, units. Uh, they have a grammatical system that orders those units, uh, which uses grammatical rules uh, and roles that are organized hierarchically. Uh, there's cross-cultural diversity of these structures, so there's no one universal visual language. Rather, there's lots of different cultures that have uh, different visual languages. So why do American comics look different than American comics? They're literally written in different la visual languages, right? And that's the distinction. Um, and there's possibly overlapping cognitive processes that underlie that understanding, as well as a host of other things about this. So um, we're going to focus on 
these ones here today. Um, OK, so I'm going to make a broad analogy, as I have already, between the structure of a sequence of images and the structure of a sequence of words, right? Um, they both have these grammatical parts. Now, immediately you might be thinking, well, words are very different than images, right? And one main way that that is true is that images contain far more information than individual words, right? Uh, I've heard the ratio is 1,000 to 1. I'm not sure if that's completely right. Thank you for those of you who laughed at that joke. Um, but um, clearly, they convey different information, right? And that's going to change the way that the system works, possibly. But the same question is true, right? And that question is, how is it that we are able to create meaning out of a sequence of units? Um, what is it that happens in our minds, and what is it that happens in our brains? And on that level, the question is the same for how we engage these things. OK, so let's first talk about a little bit about the structures of this language. Okay? So what is a visual vocabulary? And here, usually, the first objection that people make is, well, you know, but there's you know, no vocabulary of memorized panels, right? like memorized words. Um, so let's talk about what a vocabulary is. So uh, a vocabulary is made up of mappings between form and meaning uh, that are stored in, uh, in the case of spoken language, that mapping is of sound to meaning, right? So we usually like to think about these mappings in, that are stored in people's heads as you know, words, part of our vocabulary, right? So uh, they might be whole words like dance and wonderful, but there might be parts of words, like un or shun, which are uh, affixes that can modify larger units to build something even bigger. But we still store these units as pieces, which is why I can make up words like unmangasize, which is to make something not look like a Japanese comic, right? Which, you know, I kind of just made that up, but it's, you know, it still uses this, these prefixes. We can do things novelly with them, right? Um, and you can actually do this with pieces that are bigger than words, too, like idioms, like kick the bucket to mean die, right? Now, it's different if it means strike a pail, right? But um, as an idiom, that means you have multiple words that then have a different meaning on their own. So you have to store that in your head. So in the case of uh, the visual languages, we simply have a different type of mapping. The form changes. It's no longer sound. The form is graphics. But we still make that mapping to meaning. So um, it's worth saying that languages do these sorts of things in different ways. So an analytic system of analytic morphology or analytic lexical items, um, you have a, a sentence like this. The two of them were apparently really hungry, where basically each unit serves as a grammatical unit in the, in the sequence, right? And those units have meaning. Uh, and then we store these things mostly um, as whole units in our, in our heads. Um, but synthetic lexical items are actually built constructively. Uh, so this is. Uh, from the language Yupik, which is a, a northern Canadian uh, native language. Um, and in this case, um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, but this is one word. And this word is the equivalent of that sentence in meaning. So they pack a lot more in. And in fact, this word is not stored in their head, but the pieces are. So you can have these larger units that are constructed novelly, uh, but are built of memorized pieces which can't stand on their own, is the idea. And that's similar to the way images work. So can we find evidence, then, that there are systematic pieces of images that then add up to what look like novel larger units? And the answer is yes, so to preview that for you. Um, these are all hands uh, done by a comic creator. Now, you might think, well, it's all repeti repetitious. This is some you know, hack who just copies things. This is actually Jack Kirby, who is uh, probably the most influential comic artist, uh, American comic artist of superheroes uh, in the 20th century. Um, and you can tell that he's influential because these are all hands. Uh, it's the identical schema, same pattern, by Jim Lee, who is probably the most popular artist uh, in the 90s and since. He's currently the vice president of DC Comics. Uh, and these are all hands by Eric Larson, who is another major American comic artist. Uh, for a while, was the publisher at Image Comics. They're all the same pattern, right? And in fact, you can say that they're playing with it. So Eric has three fingers or two fingers in the same pattern, right? So it's tweaked just slightly. But it's the same identical pattern across everybody. 
Um, these are all what should appear as pretty novel looking faces. Each one should look pretty unique, right? Pretty different. Um, you know, these faces look very different from each other. If you zoom in, you see that all the ears are the same here. All the mouths are the same here. So that's to say that they have these schematic pieces that they're storing in their heads and they're going to redeploy, right? So what makes them look different is maybe they have different noses that they're putting on people or different jaws and different other things that then construct the look of people to look very different from each other. Um, on a larger level, these are all Peanuts comic strips. If you notice, um, Linus looks almost identical in all of these. Um, in fact, I didn't circle some of them, but you know, if you go down here, the bottom part, that looks identical too. So he's just, he's not like sitting there copying himself all the time. This is just his schema for drawing Linus sitting down with a blanket. Uh, similarly, Snoopy running, it's basically the identical, identical looks, right? So you get this repetitive patterns for the ways in which things are being drawn. Even though it looks very different when it's in context. You don't think about it as being patterned in that way. Um, we also have more creative things like these, um, which are kind of floating above the head stuff. Uh, I've actually argued that these are a class of items. This is a type of affix. Uh, and so I call it an upfix because it's an affix that's up, right? Um, so upfixes have these kind of curious properties of floating above a head. And in fact, they have certain restrictions to them. So uh, for example, if you move them to the side of the head, it probably doesn't make as much sense. Uh, it needs to be above the head. Um, and if the face kind of disagrees with the emotion, uh, it ends up looking very strange, right? So you have these kind of constraints on this combination. Um, and we've done some uh, studies on this recently showing that these are indeed you know, good constraints on uh, people judge these things as much worse when this happens. Um, there's, this is a cheat sheet that floated around the comic industry kind of in the underground for decades before the internet happened and then it suddenly was everywhere uh, called T Wallywood's 22 Panels That Always Worked. Wallywood was a uh, comic artist. Um, and an editor asked him to help out the rookies uh, with their, the way their panels worked. So um, he designed this kind of cheat sheet for lots of different compositional ways to spice up boring dialogue scenes. Um, and this has kind of, I think unconsciously to people, served as a template for whole level templates for panels. And in fact, this one here, the big head schema number one, uh, you can find across many different comics. Um, where now it's not these people had the, the template and were looking at Wally Wood's things and thinking, I'm gonna use the big head schema now. Rather, they, you know, these are people who also read comics and have then internalized this pattern, and then they use it when they feel it's appropriate, right? Because they're speakers of this visual language. Um, so that's to say that we have different mappings of form and meaning, right? Graphics and meaning that are stored in people's heads uh, that people then reuse productively as they're drawing, and that's what drawing is. Uh, so if you feel, if you're one of the people who very hesitant is like, I can't really draw. Um, that literally means you haven't learned a visual vocabulary. You haven't learned the vocabulary items to redeploy to be able to be a proficient drawer, to have a vocabulary, right? All right, let's talk about the grammar now. So that's vocabulary. Let's move into the grammar domain. Uh, so the easiest idea that you might think about the way that in which, say, sequential images might work is simply to have a mapping, again, of graphics to meaning just at a higher level of meaning. So this is the approach that's taken when you, for example, have theories that say, well, I'm just going to look at the meaningful changes that happen between images, like changes in characters or causation or something like that. Um, and this is the approach that was taken by Scott McCloud in his book, Understanding Comics, uh, which was really the first, uh, in America, the first thing to really look at the structures of these visual languages, I would say. Um, there are some problems, though, and this is what he called panel transitions. So you have different types of meaningful shifts between panels. Uh, there's some problems with a pure panel transition approach, though. For example, um, these images might be difficult to understand on their own. Uh, it might be hard to tell what's going on here. Um, if you can't tell what's going on in something, how can you make just a, a mapping to some other panel then? Uh, but if you get the context, these things make sense fine, right? And you suddenly know what that actual pictorial content is. Which means that there's something, there's top-down knowledge that having a larger sequence gives you about understanding individual units. Um, in a sequence like this, which I'm gonna keep showing you over and over again, so you should really get used to the sequence. Um, 
you probably recognize that these two panels go together somehow. Uh, that there's something meaningful about them as a group, not just the linear relationship between them. And these four go together as a group, right? That goes beyond just their individual relationships. Um, in addition, you have a sequence like this, which I'll let, let you kind of take in for a little bit. So they're playing baseball. Uh, Charlie hits a ball. Linus goes chasing it. And then you have uh, Linus coming up to Snoop, uh, Lucy, excuse me, and um, building a sandcastle and running off and catching the ball again, right? So um, what you might tell is that in this panel here is almost identical to this panel here. Um, and really what happens is if you unfurl this sequence into a linear sequence, you'll notice that what's actually going on is you have this kind of embedded clause in it. You have this sequence about sandcastles plunked down into a sequence about baseball. And uh, that means you have to somehow connect this panel to this one over here, right? And I can tell you that, yes, this is an embedded clause because we can unfurl these uh, from each other. We can pull them out from each other, and they, they both work fine, right? You understand them as individual sequences um, on their own. But together, they make an even bigger meaning that is actually funny because of the embedded clause, right? Uh, so you can't do that with just a linear sort of transition approach. You need to have something that allows you to make these distance connections. So this same thing happened in linguistics, all right? So in earlier uh, in the first half of the uh, 20th century, linguistics viewed a grammar like this, this uh, basically Markov chains. So you get uh, you know one word, and then you kind of make a probabilistic decision about what the next thing is going to be or not, right? Um, and the problems with this approach were basically the same as in uh, that I, the argument that I just made. You can't make distance connections very, very well and things like that. Uh, so what they really needed was they needed an additional piece. They needed a grammar to be able to account for these connections. Um, which is to say that even though you might experience language linearly, uh, underlying it there might be groupings of hierarchies, uh, hierarchic relationships between words, and this is the grammar. Right? These sorts of embedded uh, fit phrase structures and things like that. So the same is true here. It's that instead of this grammar being a syntactic structure that has, say, like nouns and verbs, it's more of a narrative structure in this case. So what does this structure consist of? Well, uh, you might start off a strip with what I call an establisher, which basically sets things up, uh, gives you information without acting upon it. So basically, these characters really aren't doing anything. It's just saying, here are the characters that will maybe do stuff. Right? Um, an initial starts things off, so it gets things going a little bit. The peak has the climax or the culmination of the sequence. And the release kind of gives you the resolution or aftermath, uh, prototypically kind of the coda of events. Um, now, these are pretty similar to kind of traditional notions of narrative. And they all go into a you know, canonical narrative arc in this order. Um, now, I should stress that these narrative structures are not meaningful on their own. Uh, they map to aspects of events. So an establisher is usually a passive state. Um, nothing's going on, right? They're just sitting there. An initial is usually a preparatory action. Something is about to happen. Um, a peak is a completed action. Uh, and a release is a coda of an action, like what happens afterwards, right? But this isn't always the case. These are just the prototypical mappings. So in a sequence like this, there, these things are non-prototypical. So we still we have an establisher that here sets up the interaction between Snoopy and the hockey puck. But notice they're both in motion, right? Snoop, the hockey puck is moving. Snoopy surprised, right? And in fact, the puck is introduced to Snoopy as you are introduced to them. So there's kind of a nice double introduction going on there. In this case. The initial isn't a preparatory action. He's not about to chase it or starting to chase it. He's in the process of already chasing the puck. This is no longer a completed action here. It's the interruption of an action, right? And this is not the direct aftermath of this event. In, if, if it was the coda of an action, he'd be like, you know, run over uh, on the ice or something, flattened on the ice, which does happen in other strips. I read a lot of peanuts. Um, we do research with them, which is why you see these things. So. Uh, but this is like his reaction to that event, right? So, but they still form the same kind of canonical narrative arc, okay? So our first analogy with kind of syntax is that narrative is separate from, yet it interfaces with meaning. Okay, it's not the same as meaning, but they interface together. 
Now, if we just stopped there, uh, we would only have sequences that are four units in length, right? And that'd be really boring. Um, so how do we then account for these additional things? Well, in this case, we have a very prototypical initial. It's the preparation and a completion, right, of the, uh, the hitting of the ball. These form their own little mini arc, let's say. But now we can map these together. And in this case now, this whole grouping acts as an initial that sets up this whole grouping that acts as a peak, right? So not only do individual units play these roles, but whole groupings play these roles. So that gives us our second analogy, which is narrative uses constituent structures, so larger hierarchic relationships. OK, so with that, we can now return to our sandcastle example. And we can account for that distance connection, because the architecture looks like this. And we have our embedded clause that looks smack here in the middle which is what I call prolongation, which is kind of a medial extender between an initial and a peak oftentimes. So this is what allows you to have this embedded clause. And if you were to pull this out, it would just be an arc on its own because it's not playing a role in a larger structure. Right? So this sort of grammar is able to handle this pretty easily. All right, so I presented to you a bunch of theoretical constructs. Right? Um, to what degree might they be true? <laughs> And ju not just me making stuff up, right? Make, having theories. So if we're going to say that visual language is analogous to verbal language, then we can study it using analogous methods, uh, using cognitive science methods and psychological methods. So the method that I'm going to talk to you about today is EEG, uh, which is uh, looking at uh, people's brain waves, essentially, the electrical activity of their brain. So what we do is we have people in a lab, um, and we ha put this nice shower cap that has these little electrodes on it. Um, and we put it on people's heads and we play them comic strips on the screen. Um, and we measure their brain activity uh, with this cap amplified. The signal's not very loud, so we've got to amplify it really big and we feed that into a computer. And the raw EEG looks like this, um, is very messy because it's essentially the total sum of everything that the brain is experiencing at that time. But we time lock to individual points, say comic panels. Uh, and we can tell what's happening at that time by averaging across lots of trials and averaging across lots of people, and you get these nice smooth waveforms that can be, tell you about things. So let's say, um, and this is, uh, for, you can do this with words, you can do this with uh, images, you can do this with all sorts of things. Um, so let's say these are two different types of sequences. One is good, one is bad, right? Uh, in context, right, of whatever sequence it's in. If the waves were right on top of each other, it would mean that the brain is not differentiating between them. So there's no difference in the processing. But when there's a separation between those waves, it means that there's something that's different going on in the brain. Okay? Um, so that's the way to kind of read these plots. This is time on this case. Uh, and by convention, so this is electricity, so there's negative and positive. And by convention, negative is plotted up. Uh, don't ask me why. It's just that's the way it is. Some people plot it positive up, and we don't like them. We kind of shun them. So, um, OK. In previous works, um, through language over the last 30 years, the people have actually recognized patterns in the brain waves that are associated with different types of processing. We're going to focus on three specific ones in language processing. So if I give you a sentence like, the cat won't eat the food, and you compare eat the food, which should sound like a normal sentence, to the cat won't bake the food, you get this little blip here. Okay? And that happens about 400 milliseconds after the onset of the word bake. Okay? Um, and that's called an N400 effect. N meaning negative polarity uh, compared to the, the normal one, the white, which would be eat the food. And it usually has to do with problems with meaning, with uh, difficulty understanding the meaning of something. Now, this is problem with meaning because cats don't usually bake food, right? At least not my cats. Um, so you get this sort of meaningful thing. It's different if you get something like the cat won't eating the food, which should sound grammatically bad, but it's still meaningfully OK, in which case you get this other deflection, this big positivity here. And that peaks around 600 milliseconds, so it's been called the P600, which is usually associated with kind of grammatical errors. Um, so we have these kind of two different waveforms that have to do with meaning and grammar. It's not quite that clean anymore. But we're going to pretend it is just for today to make it easier. Um, 
if you were to have the cat won't baking the food, uh, you would get both an N400 and a P600 at the same, uh, at the same time. And I believe this work was actually done over at UW, uh, uh, this, this particular experiment. Um, there is also uh, a different sort of negativity that happens when you do something like maxes of proof the theorem, which should sound uh, really bad. And what's happening is you're messing with the, the, the tree structures there, those constituent structures. Uh, and you get this kind of left anterior negativity. So this is, again, around 400 milliseconds. But this one has a particular distribution on the scalp that's kind of left anterior, uh, very specifically. And it has to do with grammatical processing also. OK, so let's now use this, these precedents to study this first analogy, that the narrative is separate from meaning. OK? So in this study, what we did was we presented people with sequences like this one you've already seen, um, where our peak panel, our culmination, uh, makes sense. Right? Here's our, our big culminating panel. So we also then had semantic anomalies. Okay? So in this case, this panel shouldn't make sense in the context of the sequence, but it still has this kind of culminating vibe to it, right? It has this culmination to it. So it's a semantic anomaly, but it's still grammatically OK. okay? If you have a sequence like this, you now have, it should be semantically OK in that it, insofar as that it still relates to baseball, the strip is still about baseball, but this panel doesn't make sense here, right? It's not a culmination anymore, it's more of a preparation, which is more like an initial panel, okay? So this is a grammatical error. And we can do that with both of them now. So now you have this kind of grammatical error because it's more like a preparation, it's an, more like an initial, but it's about not about baseball anymore. So it's both grammatically bad and meaningfully bad, okay? So we show people these things one image at a time, measure their brain waves. This is what we found, okay? This is the waveforms that we find at that critical panel. Um, and this is essentially the N400 effect. So you get this larger N400 effect to the ones that are violating the meaning. So the double violation is more than the single violation of meaning. And both of those are larger than the one that's to the, the grammatical violation. Now, this doesn't mean that the N400 is telling you about there's, that there's grammar here. Okay? N400 happens basically with anything that is unexpected, unpredictable in meaning. Certainly, this is not going to be very predictable as a subsequent panel here, right? Um, so you might get a little bit of an N400 effect, but not as big as when you violate the meaning, okay? So now, let's look at the very next panel, the panel after this. We find this, which is our P600 effect. You get this positive deflection now. In this case, this positivity happens only for the ones that violate the grammar. The one that has a violation of meaning was no different than the normal one. Now, we saw previously, you got a big N400 of that, right? And it seems really weird in context. But it's not giving you any sort of P600 effect because it's not a grammatical error, right? And so this is evidence, then, that there is this separation between this narrative structure, which the violations give you a P600, and the meaningful violations that give you an N400 effect, right? So you get these two different structures. Okay. That's analogy one. Analogy two was that we get this hierarchic constituent structure, right, uh, of this structure. So let's see if we can find evidence of that. So in kind of classic experiments back in the 60s, when they were first trying to find out if this was the case for language, uh, they did this technique called the click technique, where they played people's sentences in one ear, and in the other ear, they played white noise that sounded like a click. And that click either happened at the break between clauses, so at the separation of structures, or inside the structures, right? Maybe in the second clause or in the first clause. So what, you, what they found was that, as you might expect, it's easier to understand or recall uh, where the click happens if it happens at the break, because that's a natural break between constituents, right? You might expect you could put a comma there, and it would be OK, right? Or you could pause in that sentence. But it's harder to understand the ones that violate the structures because they actually disrupt a cohesive unit. So we did the exact same sort of paradigm. We took our sequences like this, and we took blank white squares, and we put them either, they appeared either at the break between the structures, inside the first structure, 
or inside the second structure. And we had multiple different types of structures, so the, the boundary wasn't always at the second position. It could be at different positions. So people could just, by position alone, guess where the break would occur. So you have these different white panels, okay? So uh, they look kind of like this, except people get them one panel at a time. The reason for that is when you measure brain waves, any muscle activity that happens might be uh, basically noise, electrical noise. So if people are moving their eyes around a lot, like reading a comic page, uh, that's going to create noise. Uh, in addition to that, you don't know where they're looking to, to lock those brain waves to. So we do it one at a time. So this is really this kind of like disruption jolt for them. This is what we found at the blank white panel. Okay, so this is at the white panel itself. We found this, which is uh, a left anterior negativity, so this left lateralized negativity, uh, that's larger to the disruptions within the constituents than the ones between the constituents. So people are differentiating here between the disruptions of the whole groupings than the ones that fall in between groupings. We also, though, found in the back of the head this posterior positivity. So again, this is the P600 effect that we were talking about before. In this case, it just happened to the ones in the second constituent relative to things that were not in the second constituent, things that were in the earlier ones. OK, so let's disentangle these results. So first of all, the violations of the constituents were uh, worse than the ones that were between constituents, showing there is evidence that people are making this grouping. Okay? Notice that this cannot be a transition between panels. So it is the case that there's like a major break at a lot of these, these boundaries, right? Like there's a character change. But by the time you get to the one that's within the first constituent and the one that's between constituents, your brain already can tell there's a difference between them, right? But you don't know that you've passed out of that constituent yet. You don't know that you've shifted into the next thing because you haven't gotten there yet, right? But the brain is already differentiating between them, okay? Which means you're actively predicting upcoming structure. You're not just integrating things that you've already gotten to. So you, that means there has to be some sort of structure there that you're making predictions with. Okay, what about that positivity we saw out here in the second constituent only? So what I think is happening in this case is it's essentially like getting a comma in the wrong place, like one word too late, right? So you read this, you cross the boundary, you get another comma, you think, oh, maybe this is a boundary. So you try to group all of these uh, panels here into one unit, which they can't be grouped in one unit. So you have to kind of reanalyze that. And that's what gives you this positivity, is trying to make this ungrammatical grouping of everything that had, you saw before. OK. Let's go beyond just the visual narrative, but just the visual language. Okay, so that does give us some clues that there is indeed this structure here, right? Okay, so first of all, it should be easy to tell that if you just took, get, got rid of these panels and replaced them with text, it would still tell a decent story, right? So we would then assume that the structure of verbal narratives uses the same sort of structure that we find in visual narratives. Um, and you probably are, have been thinking this for a while. Well, what about film? So what about film? Well, what is film doing? Well, with a camera, you can just capture stuff that happens, right? It's just like seeing. You get this kind of pervasive temporality of stuff unfolding in front of you. And when you combine that with the narrative grammar that is in your cognitive structures to cut that up, do you say film editing? You get a hybrid of these, which ends up looking something like this, like we find in film, where you have different film cuts. And each of those cuts has a different uh, property similar to the kind of structures that we talked about. Okay? So film is a hybrid between the kind of pervasive temporality of seeing and the narrative grammar. Now, naturally, again, that's going to create changes in the structure. So the fact that things move, cameras also move, is going to maybe wash out some of the finer grain structures that you find in the static form, right? And we should be able to quantify that. OK, so what you end up with is you know, this narrative structure and meaning that can then map to lots of different types of modalities, right? And the, mo the different structures that it operates with will then change the way that that structure operates. But it's essentially the same underlying system, OK?
Let's get beyond that, though, okay? So, or the big view here, then, is that we have these, these numerous interacting structures that we, we've talked about, right? So, what are different behaviors? Well, spoken language is essentially this grouping here, out of this system. It's the emergent structure that happens when you combine syntax, phonology, and meaning. A written language then adds the graphics, because you now need to have this link between phonology and graphics, because you are making sound into life, right? A visual language just selects a different portion of this overall structure. So a visual language is the mapping of narrative, graphics, and meaning, right? When you have, say, individual images that don't have a narrative structure, you get single images like this, where now you have just a mapping of graphics to meaning without the narrative structure, right? So the overall system just depends on what par portions are being engaged at what time. Okay. Now let's get a little bit weirder, okay? Um, music has also, if you, and if you had sound, you could hear some music playing, but um, music also has been hypothesized to have a grammatical structure to it, a hierarchic system. Now this system doesn't have meaning to it. It's not conveying concepts anymore. But there is still an ordering system to the hierarchy of how we understand music. So when they do brainwave studies with music, and play, say, off-key notes that violate that grammar, you get waveforms that, lo and behold, look similar to what we have already been seeing. So you get this P600 in the back of the brain, the back of the head, I should say, not the brain necessarily, but the back of the head, um, to off-key notes. And you get anterior negativities, in this case, more right lateralized instead of left lateralized, uh, that map to kind of the same sort of anterior negativities. And people believe that these are the same cognitive mechanisms that are underlying these as well. So if it's the case that you use the same kind of cognitive structure, the same brain response to language and music and visual language, right? Well, maybe it's the case that you don't have a dedicated like place in the brain for each of these things, but rather there's a place in the brain generally that does processing of kind of grammatical structures. And it does so differently for each of these channels. So if we were to open this up even bigger then, what we see is with this kind of combination of grammar, modality, and meaning, a language has all three, right? Whether it's in a visual language, a spoken language, or a sign language, language gets the magic combination of all three of these. Now, if you just get rid of the grammar, you still have a communication system, right? Single images, uh, gestures. Now, obviously, language is also within communication, but it's a special type that uses all three of these together. But there's another mapping that we might have, which is that we might leave out the meaning and just have a grammar map to a modality. And that's what happens with music and dancing and other channels that are not full languages, right? So w again, it depends on what portions of the overall system are being selected and go to each other. So it's less about the individual sort of place of comprehension it's more what emergent structures occur out of common underlying structures. And that's where I'll end it. So that's to say that studying the visual language of comics can really tell you a lot about the brain even bigger and the, the bigger picture. And I'd just like to acknowledge my advisors and collaborators in Fanographics, which gave me all the peanut stuff to use. So uh, thank you very much.